is okay just having the so um thank you everybody for getting up so early this morning and joining us for the breakfast i have to say that uh, my time here in new zealand has been just wonderful the people that i've met with the communities that we've engaged with in auckland and in rotorua and now here in wellington there's such an energy in um, New Zealand that I think, you know, we're really, you guys are um, doing the work already. Um, Tina said that it takes a village to raise a child. I think it takes communities to raise a country. Um, and so the work that is happening across communities here in New Zealand is just awesome. And I think that uh, this country, I said yesterday um, to the group that I met with that I'm expecting big things after I leave and we'll be following the progress of uh, collective impact here in New Zealand. One of the things that we try to do at Tamarack, the organization that I work for, we're um, an institute for community engagement. And that means essentially that we work, um, we try to harvest the knowledge and the capacity and the really good ideas that happen at the local level and to bring them up to the national level and to work across Canada um, and internationally to share best practices, emerging practices. Our mission is um, the co-generation of knowledge for social change. And we really believe that the capacity at the local community level is so vibrant, they're doing some really incredible things, but sometimes it stays within the local community. And so to really raise it up, to share it, what we see is that scale happens much more quickly. But we also respect very uh, much the local community context because, you know, that's where the connected tissue is. That's where the fibers are. That's where we know one another. And there are things about each of our local communities that make um, something possible or prevent something from happening. So we heard about simple, complicated, and complex problems, and that's something that we think about a lot at Tamarack. Um, and we know that communities are changing. We know that there is, uh, they're facing much more complicated or much more complex problems, um, whether they're poverty, homelessness, uh, economic development, neighborhood revitalization, or even environmental issues, that these problems are joined up together, right? So if you're wanting to deal with the issue of poverty and you know that uh, there's, uh, the family in your community has uh, insecure housing and are moving three and four times during the course of the school year, that child is unlikely to do well in school. So you can't just deal with housing, you can't just deal with the education system, you really have to deal with the joined up nature of the problems. And I think that that's, uh, that's why we at uh, Tamarack have been following um, this work that uh, has happened in the United States around collective impact. We didn't know it 10 years ago when we started a journey with uh, 13 cities across Canada to work on poverty reduction that we were working in a collective impact kind of way. But when the paper was published in 2011, there was the angels singing from the heavens, you know, oh, this is what we're doing. And I'm sure that as you hear about collective impact this morning, you'll, you'll reflect a little bit on the work that you're doing in your organizations and in your communities and you'll say yes in fact many of the aspects that we're doing around collective impact are uh, are things that we already have in the practice i think where collective impact is different from collaboration and the collaboration that we're all involved in is this notion of measurement the notion that we have to use information to really understand that complex problem going into it, right? That it's not just about poverty, but we need to know who in our communities are living in poverty and what is their vulnerability to that issue. So data at the very beginning, as you start to unpack very complex issues is very critical. And sometimes that data is hidden in our communities. And so we need to figure out what are the strategies, who can we talk to in our communities to uncover some of that information, some of that really relevant information so that we can begin to move the needle on this really complex issue. And then, as we begin to work collectively in our communities, when we bring different voices to the table, which is what collective impact is all about, is bringing different voices to the table, business, government, the voluntary sector and citizens, both citizens with the lived experience, but also citizens across our communities. We really have to think about how can we build a common agenda? 
So how can we understand collectively that we're going to move forward rather than just diving into the work, which is often what we do in collaborative work, it's that time in conversation where we get to really understand, so what are the real housing problems? What are the real environmental problems? How do we unpack it? What does the data tell us about it? So that's a really critical first step. So common agenda is critical, and the elements of a common agenda not, are not only just an aspiration, in Hamilton, when I was doing this work around poverty reduction, we talked, our aspiration was to make Hamilton the best place to raise a child. And some, some of you might say, well, what does that have to do with poverty? Well, if we have 25% of our children living in families that are poor, we're certainly not the best place to raise a child. But that aspiration opened the door to the conversation about poverty that was such a pressing conversation for our community. And it actually brought people to the conversation that may not have joined us in a conversation about poverty. So having an aspiration is a critical piece, but then we also need to build a plan, a plan for change. So what are we actually tactically going to do in our communities and how are we going to move forward? And it's the aspiration and the plan that form that common agenda. Um, we've seen it <clears throat> in the United States. Um, we've seen some really exciting examples of uh, collective impact. Some of you may have heard about STRIVE in Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky. STRIVE is a cradle to career educational uh, attainment um, uh, collective impact initiative. And so what STRIVE is doing, STRIVE has pulled together 300 organizations from a whole variety of sectors. The business community, the not-for-profit community, the healthcare sector, um, the educational sector, of course, and uh, citizens, and what they're saying is that every child that is born in Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky will enter school being ready to learn, will have educational success throughout their school career, will graduate from high school, will enter into college and university, will graduate from college and university, and then there will be jobs in Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky for those individuals. That is their common agenda. That's their big, hairy, audacious goal. They started in 2003 building their collective impact initiative. It's now just slightly, you know, a number of years later. What they've seen in that very short period of time since 2003 is a 10% increase in high school graduation rates and a 16% increase in college enrollment. And of the 72 measures that they track, and, they're, and they have a very detailed uh, pathway, the 72 measures, they have made measurable progress in a very short period of time on 40 of those 72 measures, more than 10%. And what that says to me is that if you focus your community around an issue that is challenging and vexing to that community, and you invite lots of partners in and you say, look, this is what we're aspiring for, because we believe it will transform our community. People come, resources come, and change happens. But you have to be able to measure that change, and you have to be able to create the story of that change with your partners. And you have to understand why did that change happen, and what are we learning from that change, and what do we continue to do because it's successful, and what do we let go because it's not so successful. That's hard for all of us when we're entering into this work, because Typically, funders will fund in short-term um, uh, uh, segments, and um, they want uh, incredible outcomes. And then us in the voluntary sector, I come from the voluntary sector, and we agree to that, right? We say, okay, we'll take that funding, and we'll, give you, we'll try to give you the outcomes, and we'll be sustainable after the funding goes. But that actually is not helping our communities. It's actually not transforming our communities, because um, it leads to isolated organizations with isolated impacts. They're doing good work, and that's important, but we're not getting community transformation. So Kanye and Kramer, the folks that wrote the initial paper um, on collective impact, what they were trying to get at in the first paper was we need to have different conversations. We need to have different conversations in the voluntary sector. We need to have different conversations with government, with our funders, um, with the business community about what is realistic. What can we achieve in a two-year funding cycle? What could we achieve if you were to stretch out that funding cycle to four years, to five years? What could we achieve if, in, uh, like in Canada, 
we got 10 years worth of funding from the J.W. McConnell Family Foundation to really explore poverty reduction. And what we found in that 10-year action learning experiment uh, across 13 cities was that we thought we would impact the lives of 5,000 people. We actually impacted the lives of 202,000 people across 13 cities. So patient capital is a critical thing. Looking to long-term solutions is also very critical. And really trying to wrap our, 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 our ideas and our energy around this complexity that our communities are facing, these complex issues, it's really critical that we begin to think about how do we do that and how do we have different conversations in our communities around collective impact but with our partners about this, the important and um, I think really critical change that we need to have um, both in, uh, in New Zealand here, in Australia where I was, and also in Canada and in the United States. I met yesterday with the Deputy Prime Minister, um, Minister of Finance, and um, what I took away from that uh, conversation is that you guys are just on the cusp. Right? You're, you're already looking at complex issues and you're already funding things that are critical to the success of uh, New Zealand. And I hope that in the couple of days that I'm here with you and talking to lots of groups about collective impact and all its various components, that, you'll, that, that the participants will walk away from those sessions and think, um, how can we do this? How can we change the conversation? How can we move the needle on education? How can we move the needle on family violence? How can we move the needle on the environment? Collective Impact provides a framework for that. Um, and uh, I think it's important for all of us to look at how frameworks can apply to our work and can we, can we scale up our work in a, in a very pragmatic way. So I noticed that I have not moved my slides at all, but I'm at the end of my time. Uh, it's, it's almost like you put me on the stage and I start talking and then I go in a, in a direction. I think I'd like to leave you with just a couple of final thoughts. What we've seen in Canada and the US is this work makes a difference and it makes a difference for the communities that we are supporting. The other thing that we've seen is that a critical component is bringing business to the table and bringing people with the lived experience of the issue to the table. Because what they create in this work is a sense of urgency um, around that change. Business uh, people want really quick solutions and that's good. You know, they're very impatient. But equally in the poverty work that we've seen in Canada, people with the lived experience have they need those really quick solutions. And it's only by bringing them to the table, by bringing different voices into the conversation, by opening it up to our whole community that we're gonna get whole community solutions. So thank you very much. she's kept so well to her time do we have Gator? We have we have ten or fifteen minutes for questions and discussion. Now for the sake of the video it would be really helpful if people are willing to identify themselves when they ask a question. Um, it's always really nice to know and Joan at the back there has a microphone to assist with that. So um, please questions. Thank you Marion. Um, kia ora Liz, my name is Marion Blake from the Platform Trust, I'm also um, the Chair of Angara. Can, we read a lot about, the, uh, about Strive and Collective Impact. Can you tell us the most outrageously successful example um, in real life? Just a quick one that can actually put some real faces and people on, on, on the story that you're telling. Oh, I, the one that I'm most familiar with is the poverty reduction work in Canada. And so um, 10 years ago, we started this uh, action learning experiment with 13 cities, and we wanted to move the needle. What we've seen in those 10 years is substantive moving of the needle, not only for individuals living in poverty in these communities, as I mentioned, 
But across Canada now, there's a different kind of conversation about poverty. So just recently, the Canadian Medical Association came out with a paper. Their paper is always talk about social determinants of health. In fact, they talked about the health costs of poverty. They put words to it. Um, in the 10 years, we started off with one provincial government with a poverty reduction strategy. We now have eight of 10 provincial governments and all three territories with poverty reduction strategies. In Ontario alone, the government of Ontario, their poverty reduction strategy is called breaking the cycle. So it's a child poverty strategy. Uh, in the last two years, they've invested more than $60 billion in early learning. And they started those early learning programs in low-income schools in communities across Ontario. That's really significant. And they have moved, in the last year when they did their report, they moved 40,000 kids out of poverty in one single year. The government of Alberta is just in the process of consultations around their poverty reduction strategy. Their strategy has three goals. To eliminate child poverty in five years. To substantially reduce poverty um, across Alberta in the next 10 years. And then to have communities at the center of change. And if Alberta can reduce, if they can eliminate child poverty in five years by a number of different ways, that momentum in Canada will just continue to rise. Because I don't know if you do this in New Zealand, but we like to do this in Canada. We like to find out, uh, because the provinces are all so different, if they're doing something really well over here, let's raise that up and get the other provinces on board and competitive with one another. So that, you know, the, the, the results are really outstanding right across communities and right across provinces. Um, the only uh, challenge is that our federal government, we need to bring our federal government more on board, but recently they formed an all-party anti-poverty caucus. So that, that at least is the beginning stages of a conversation at the federal government level, because we believe you not only need communities engaged, but you need all levels of government to say, this is an issue that we're gonna put some resources in, and we need our philanthropic sector and our business communities. It's the combination of all of those where we, we believe that in a country as rich as Canada, we can do this. We just need to have the will, the collective will. So that, I hope that's a really good example for you. Oh, hi, sorry, I'm, sorry. I'm Anne Gorn from Connecting Up and Techsoup New Zealand. Um, I'm interested, Liz, in what you were talking about, about getting people to the table. <clears throat> Um, we're based in Australia and what I find is we get people to the table and then we talk and then we talk and then we talk um, and, and the actions and the implementation strategies is what we flounder on. Um, so I'm interested in your model around the implementation strategies. You obviously have some good measurement tools and stuff in place, but how do we actually get things happening rather than just talking? Um, I, think the, I think you do need to have uh, uh, an aspiration and you need to build how you're moving forward. But um, I think the thing that has been really a game changer for us in Canada is that we don't just want you as an individual at the table. We want your sphere of influence. And what that means is that we expect that if you're the director of the Board of Education or the chief of police or the mayor of the community or the chief executive of the community foundation, that not only will you be engaged in this work, but your organization will start to change as a result of it. So that the practices in your organization are going to move along this issue. And I think that what we see is that the early adopters around the table, if they can start to transform their own organizations, their businesses, their community practices, that that starts to get momentum. And then we start to, re uh, to share that momentum. So we might be making progress on our plans, but if we're not sharing that really broadly in the community and really opening up the opportunity for the community to also participate, you know, 40 people sitting around a table in a community will never solve poverty. Will never solve poverty as much as we hope that they will, but it's the whole community. So leveraging the assets of the whole community, all that good work that is actually going on in the ground and the assets of those 40 people in those organizations, those influential leaders. They talk in collective impact. One of the preconditions of collective impact is to bring influential leaders to the table. And some of us might immediately go to positional leaders, but in fact, 
influential leaders come from all parts of our community, and we need to be open to that, and we need to think about, okay, so who is the influential neighborhood leader that will be able to transform that neighborhood, and how do we bring them to the table? Who is the influential Maori leader that we need to bring to the table? So those are the, con we, you know, if we only talk to the people, I say this in a video, if we only talk to the people that we've always talked to, which is typically what we do because we, we know them, um, we're going to have the same conversations. But when we start to bring different people to the table that we haven't met, that have different spheres of uh, influence, that we can actually really change the conversation and then what that does is it builds on itself. And that's where you get transformation, I, I believe. That's been my experience. Kia ora Liz, uh, Peter Glensaw, Chair of Wesley Community Action. Thank you for that um, inspirational notion because I th think what's exciting about this country is we are such an intimate country, we all know one another already and so that many of these ideas I think become possible here in New Zealand. But from my experience both in recent leadership in local government and in the health sector, as well as the community sector, one of the issues that I'd like your thoughts about is how do we get the state agencies to put aside a little bit their own predetermined agendas in order to participate in a collective? Um, what we're finding in health, for example, is as the pressure comes on financially, that begins to dominate the conversation with other agencies rather than the common task that we're all working to, our agenda is now to balance our budgets or to meet a particular set of priorities that have been laid down by the centre, and that becomes our dominant paradigm, not whatever the collective wanted to talk about. Mm -hmm. Are you finding that same dynamic in Canada, and are there any tips about how to help move the collective agenda to become the dominant agenda? Um, so if you come to the workshop after, you'll hear lots of really good tips, but I'll, I'll give you a couple of tips that I've found. Um, there are some really essential um, things to think about when you're trying to build a common agenda in a community or at a state level or, um, at the, or at a, even at a, a federal or national level. Um, if you don't have a prior history of working together or if you've had a negative prior history, that's going to impact it. And so sometimes you might not want to go full on in a collective way on a big issue. You might want to test your relationships with a smaller um, issue and to really build your collective success there. Um, so I would say that that's, uh, so it's really judging, um, judging the relationships, judging the context, looking at what it also, else is going on and I might even say, you know, I'm always a person that looks at where are the leverage opportunities. So if health is the leverage opportunity, for example, how do we use working on health to think about, you know, our bigger agenda? So could that be an entry point in to talk about, yes, it's about health, but look at who are the people that are, and in Canada, the higher users of the healthcare dollars are people that are using emergency rooms that um, don't have access to family doctors or to medical clinics. And so those are often people at the lower social economic status, right? So health is an entry point for us to have a conversation about poverty, which is the conversation that we're most interested in. So I think we have to not, um, to really look at where are the leverage opportunities, do we have a prior history, and then also think about could this issue, if, this go if the government or the community is interested in this issue, how does it align with the issues that our group is interested in? We had a very interesting conversation yesterday, or two days ago in Rotorua. Um, there are a number of organizations that are talking together and they've received some funding around children. Um, uh, improving educational outcomes and family violence and so they were talking about you know all we're do what we're all doing is actually trying to make children count in our community so they started to broach on um, uh, the notion of uh, children and making every child count 
And um, Barbara McLennan said, well, I just attended something at the Chamber of Commerce where there was a speaker and he was talking to the Chamber about the importance of keeping youth and investing in children in Rotorua. And I thought to myself, wow, that's a great opportunity. So here we have organizations in the voluntary sector, but the Chamber is also starting to talk about it. The business community is also really starting to have an awareness of the importance of keeping youth in our community. That seems to me like a prime opportunity for bringing people together across different sectors and to say, we have a shared um, outcome. Uh, you might want uh, to keep youth so that you have employees that are happy and that you have future employees, but we are working on things where youth are going to be better educated, which actually gives you better future employees. So we have a shared outcome. There's lots of things already happening in our community, but if they're isolated and we're not open to those kinds of opportunities, we can't see the complexity and the shared outcomes. And so I think we have to we have to look beyond, if you're working in the voluntary sector, work, look beyond your own sector, and I know that many of you do, to where the other conversations are happening and then trying to understand how can we, how can we bring what we're passionate about connect, and connect it to those other conversations in the community. Thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to follow on from what you've said with some, uh, a recent experience of mine. I'm Robert Miller. I'm a community representative with the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Uh, I heard this comment from Sir Mason Dury, who, who is a prominent psychiatrist in this country, a straight talker, if ever there was one. He said, the most difficult thing for most, government, most governments is to reconcile their economic policy with their social policy. I think that's spot on, but I'd be interested in your comments on that. Oh, great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> no, I, I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. I mean, one of the... Uh, one of the things that we've been doing a lot in Canada um, is looking at what is the cost of poverty to every Canadian. And there was a really interesting report um, published in Alberta um, a couple of years ago. So the cost of, a persistent, of the persistent level of poverty across the province of Alberta annually is between $7.2 billion and $9 billion. So to maintain this persistent level of poverty is $7.2 billion to nine billion dollars across the province of Alberta. That's one province. We can't afford it as taxpayers, and I think that's a very powerful argument. But we don't, in the voluntary sector, we don't often think about the economics of the issues that we're trying to move the needle on. And so I do think we have to join economics with social policy. And there are people in our wider networks who will help us do that. In the next couple of weeks um, in Canada, Vibrant Communities is coming out with the business case for cities reducing poverty. And as we scale from 13 cities to 100 cities, this business case is going to help transform the conversation. And we'll be sure to, uh, to send it to uh, our colleagues at Calm Voices and Inspiring Communities, because hopefully you'll be able to make it a New Zealand business case. So, bring it within your own culture and actually use it to transform conversations in your communities as well. You're welcome. <coughs> we still have time for a final question if there are interested people. In. Well, that case, we like to make sure these, these are really, really prompt events that, that people are, can, you know, that, that we leave finish at 8.30. And you can see what I meant when I said that Tamarack have been incredibly generous. Um, our experience of, of Liz today confirms our previous experience of people from Tamarack about how generous and insightful they are about the complex issues we tackle. And I want to leave us with just a few thoughts around, um, around going back out to, the, to your jobs today, around remembering some of these issues. For me, the stuff that is particularly resonates is, is not talking only to the people we talk to bringing other parties, other interests into conversations, I think is quite difficult, much more difficult. Um, I, certainly from my position in Convoices, I feel that it's a, a real challenge for us to get beyond talking to who we normally talk to. 
So I'm particularly interested in that aspect. And the workshop Liz talked about, referred to a couple of times, um, vocational, uh, Tess, I've forgotten the name. The Federation of Vocational Support Services is hosting a workshop with Liz um, after this, which we had a resounding, like with this breakfast, um, response to. And we had over 40 people register, which is fabulous. So we're going on and doing that with her this morning. So I want to, there's a, um, another couple of thanks, another couple of um, comments to make. Louisa asked me to particularly, and it was a good chance to introduce, who she's just as a bit, Joan Isaac. Joan has just started working for Comvoices as our administrator and blogger. And she um, has been, um, her baptism by fire was organizing a parliamentary breakfast within three weeks of starting her very part-time position. And um, Louisa's office particularly said what a pleasure she was to work with. So. Um, I thought, nice, to, nice to acknowledge and give you a chance to meet Joan, who's our, just been carrying the microphone around. And just from a, a final voice note from Convoices is we would be very interested in having another breakfast before the end of the year. And if any of the organize, community organizations here have speakers or conferences or visitors coming that you'd like to host at a breakfast, please let us know. And with that, thank you very much for coming today. Thanking everyone who comes as these breakfasts wouldn't happen without people getting out of bed and coming early to collaborate and be collective together. So thank you for your effort and have a nice day.